Hey, it's Garrett. Welcome back to Ephesians 2, 11 through 18. The main idea here is that Jesus is creating in himself one new mankind, one new people group in place of the two, making peace between them. And the two he has in mind are the Jews and the Gentiles. At this time, those are the two summary people groups of the world. There's the Jews, the chosen people of God for the last 2,000 years at that time from their vantage point, and then the Gentiles, which is the nations, the everybody else of the world. And the thesis of this paragraph, it, with major application for us today, is that in Jesus, um, tribalism disappears because there's one new mankind in place of all the other barriers that used to be there, and that makes peace between us. So let's look at this pattern. Um, the two becoming one, so there's peace. The two becoming one, so there's peace. It says it here, for he himself is our peace. Why? Because he's made us both one, and he's broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, so that he might create in himself one in place of the two, which makes peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body. Um, so there's one way to God through the cross by faith, and that kills the hostility between us. And then it says, why does this work this way? And he says, because he came. Well, how does it, how does this, how do we pull this off? Because he came, Jesus did this, and he preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. Jesus gave peace to everyone. He gave love to everyone. So he had a way of pulling for those who were far off. He, he honored women at a time when women were not honored. He included people from every background and political party, Simon the Zealot, Matthew the tax collector, and then uh, blue-collar, straightforward workers. So, I mean, there are people, um, you see the beginnings of diversity in his earliest following. Even when he speaks to a Samaritan woman, and in John chapter 4, um, she's shocked that he even was willing to address her. So Jesus was willing to preach peace to anyone. And the argument here is that because Jesus is this way, and because this is the people group he founded, there is now peace between us. Tribalism is over, racism is out, um, and there is to be peace between us. Now, two things to note here. One, we can't just, we have to actually be about it. You can't just claim that because Ephesians 2 says this, that there's automatically racial justice in the world. There is not. We have to work for this. It takes intentionality and it takes a commitment. Um, even in Acts chapter 6, we see where uh, the early church was encountering injustice because the Hellenists' widows, the Jewish Christians, uh, the Greek Jews, uh, widows rather, were experiencing an injustice in the distribution um, of food. And that required attention. So Ephesians 2 tells us where we should be. It doesn't tell us where we are. It tells us where we need to go. So the, it does take work. And then second, it also says here that what we're killing is we're killing hostility. We're killing hostility. We're not killing ethnicity. So it's not like as soon as you become a Christian, you're automatically ethnically neutral. Everyone still has an ethnicity. Everyone still has a background. Um, everyone still has a skin tone, and that's okay. It says in heaven that every tribe and tongue and nation will be there, and that adds to its beauty. Um, so uh, rather than remove ethnicity, we are removing hostility and putting peace in its place because we're willing to uh, make real what Jesus has earned for us at the cross, which is peace between us. What an incredible resource to a world torn and unclear of how to cooperate together and live together. Christianity since the first century has offered resources for people to live together in harmony, to be a unifying principle among diverse people groups like no other nation, state, or ideology can do. Christianity uniquely can bind people together. This is incredible. And uh, the, the way he starts here, I don't want to miss the first half of this paragraph. The way he starts is he's calling for humility he's among the Gentiles because he's writing to Ephesians, a uh, very metropolitan and cosmopolitan and pagan place. They had a huge temple to a, a pagan goddess there. And so he's writing to a Gentile Christian audience and he's saying, hey, don't forget at one time, um, you were called the uncircumcision by what's called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. He refers to this because it's just a Jewish symbol. And he says, you were on the outside of that. And don't forget, before God didn't have to make this move. Before the first century, as we would call it, at that time, you were separated from Christ. You were alienated from the plan of God, from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of promise. You, you were hopeless. You were godless in this world. You were clueless as to what God was doing in the world. But now in Christ, you graciously, who were far off from the plan of God, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And Jesus said, originally, he said, I am the good shepherd, and I also have sheep who are not of this fold. So it was always the plan of Jesus to bring a broader group of people than only the people group that he had begun with, back with the beginning of Abraham walking by faith, who turned into a family that turned into a nation that produced a Savior, and then the Savior opened his arms 
to the entire world. What a gift for us in the world we live in today. See you next time.